So hello everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Genomics Aotearoa Seminar. It's great to see you all here today on, on what is proving to be a Friday. Um, so uh, today's seminar is the fantastic Thomas Buckley from Landcare Research, who's been a longtime supporter and uh, um, principal investigator with Genomics Aotearoa. And Thomas will be talking about using genomics to understand the evolution of New Zealand terrestrial invertebrates. So you know, subjects uh, very close to my heart and um, obviously some of the best science in the country. So take it away, Thomas. Um, yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, kia ora koutou. Thanks for coming, everybody. So yeah, I'm going to give um, a presentation this afternoon about some of the work that we've been doing on the genomics of native New Zealand um, terrestrial invertebrates. So I'll just get my slides working. Ah, there we go. So um, I'm going to talk about three different native invertebrate groups. So some of you might not be surprised to know I'm actually going to spend about 90% of the time talking about this insect in the middle of stick insects. Um, some of the genomics and evolutionary biology we've been doing on those. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time just updating everybody on the progress we're making on the hoo-hoo um, and the giant wetter genome sequencing. So I'm going to cover sort of three areas when I talk about the stick insects. And I should start off by saying that a lot of the work I'm going to present today um, came out of the thesis of Swing Sub Choi, who um, finished his thesis last year. And he's done genome assembly um, on the stick insects. And I'm going to talk about this. It's interesting. It's a large, complex, and highly repetitive genome. So um, it's been quite challenging. And that work was supported by Anne McCartney, who was also a, a GA postdoc uh, at Landcare a couple of years ago, uh, and Dutchall Park, and Kate Augustine, and Hester Roberts from Landcare also helped out on some of the lab work. And then I'm going to talk about how um, Shane has used the genome assembly and resequencing data to look at the history of evolution in a couple of genera of New Zealand stick insects, particularly looking at hybridization and um, polyploid evolution. And then um, I'm going to talk about how we've used that evolutionary scenario to look at gene expression in these polyploid and, and hybrid genomes. So just a bit of phylogenetic context to the species I'm talking about. This is a, um, a phylogeny we did a few years ago. It was done by a former PhD student of mine, Luke Dunning. So this radiation here, it's a large radiation of Australasian stick insects. It's a monophyletic group, but these are just exemplars. There's actually probably uh, maybe a couple of hundred species in this radiation. So um, the New Zealand ones are all in this green box. There's about 10 genera and 20 species in New Zealand. And they're found from Stewart Island in the south right up to Manawatafi, the Three Kings in, in the north of New Zealand. They're found in lowland forests and um, up into the alpine zone. And there's all sorts of interesting speciation, so on going on. Some species are really rare, are only found on offshore islands. Um, others are found over big wide areas of New Zealand. And so sister group to this radiation uh, is another bigger radiation of species found in New Caledonia. And these ones are really interesting. You can see that there's some weird looking things like this red colored um, species here. There are little tiny ones like this um, genus called Microconacus and they live in leaf litter. Um, there are some big sort of spiny arboreal ones here. This genus is called Asprenus. Um, and then there's flighted ones. And there are these things here, which we call tree lobsters, which are a, a large sort of robust flightless stick insects, mainly, mainly ground dwelling. And then sister group to the New Caledonian and New Zealand species um, is an even bigger radiation here, which we've just got a few exemplars in this tree. And these are some of the big familiar Australian species. And some of these are, are, are really gigantic. This urinema thing here, you can see sitting on someone's hand. This is a strange looking thing that likes to press itself in bark. It's called cigarophasma because it looks like a cigar, allegedly. And then um, Melandani, this is like a big leaf mimicking stick insect. So this is a sort of morphological diversity in this clade. But what I'm going to spend most of the time talking about is this little group down here. Um, it's, a, it's a subgroup of the New Zealand species. And it's, um, it's dominated by two genera, this genus Acanthoxyla and Clytarchus. And so Acanthoxyla, are the, um, it's, its genus has got quite a complex taxonomic history, but we're going to be publishing a revision um, in the next few months, and we're going to recognize three species within it. Um, there's this large, smooth species called Acanthoxyra nermis down here. 
Um, there's another species called Acanthoxyla prosina, which is the kind of one that a lot of you will be familiar with. It's green or brown. It's got black tip spines on it. It's quite common in gardens. And um, this species here is an undescribed species, which will be um, described and named soon. And what I should mention is that all of the populations and species within Acanthoxyla, apart from this one, are pathogenetic. So um, female only, whereas this species here is, is a sexually reproducing species. And so there's a bit of a mixture of reproductive modes in this genus. Um, there's some other genera here, which I'm not really going to talk about. These are more restricted geographically, but I'm going to talk about this species here, Clytarchus hookeri, and this is the so-called common New Zealand smooth stick insect. It's found through large areas of New Zealand. It's really common on Manuka. It's smooth, green, brown, and it's sexually reproducing over most of its distribution. But in the South Island, um, it's parthenogenetic. So it's a geographic parthenogen. But most of the populations I'm going to talk about today are sexual. So for, for the purpose of this talk, you can think of it as a, of a, as a sexually reproducing species. So um, quite a while ago, we published an initial look at the speciation in this genus. We'd use mitochondrial DNA and single copy nuclear genes, which we PCR'd and then cloned. And um, you'll see a phylogenetic pattern here, which this is a pattern you're going to see in several other data sets in this talk, is when you do phylogenetics on these two genera, you always get two clades. So you get this blue clade here, and this clade is comprised of alleles only found in Acanthoxyla. And then you find another clade, which is predominantly alleles sampled from Clytarchus hookeri, but also contains some alleles sampled from Acanthoxyla. And so this is a classic signal of hybridization. So you've got hybridization between these two genera. And so some acanthox individuals have Clytarchus um, alleles in them. And so um, the work we did, and um, it, there was also some work done by Mary Morgan Richards and collaborators at Massey as well, using um, ribosomal RNA genes and mitochondrial DNA. And the pattern within this is that there's probably been multiple hybridization events between these two genera. But by Cloning and sequencing the PCR products, we found that within some acanthoxyl lineages, there were three alleles. And so that was consistent with polyploidy and also a deeper history of hybridization within the genus acanthoxyla. And um, this study was done before we actually knew about the sexually reproducing species. So an important sort of component of their history was missing in these earlier studies. And so what we wanted to do is to set up a genomics pipeline that we could used to get the data needed to get um, an accurate inference of the history of, of divergence and hybridization within these genera. So um, we started off, this is work done by Chen Wu, um, who's now plant food research and her PhD thesis is a collaboration with um, myself and Richard Newcomb as well. And so Chen did a, um, a short read Illumina assembly using mate pair and PDN data and you know, this was sort of the state of play for its time, um, pretty high coverage paired in data and mate pair data. Um, but of course, you know, like all these short read assemblies, it was highly fragmented, 78,000 scaffolds, you know, greater than 2 um, KB. So we were able to do some interesting downstream biology on using this genome. Um, but of course, the technology has moved on uh, a lot since then. And so these species have large genomes. So the Clytarchus hookeri genome is about, it was over two and a half gigabases, although Chen's assembly was quite a bit bigger than that, probably because that technology wasn't able to deal with repeats properly. But you can see down here, it's 51% um, of the genome is repeats. And that's comparable to the locust genome, which is also another insect with a large genome size. This has got a genome size of 6.5 gigabases, so it's getting pretty extreme. And so these are, you know, these are really challenging um, genomes to assemble and, and, and you really need long read data to have a good go at it. So um, we started off by doing a chromium 10x assembly. This was done by Anne McCartney a few years ago, and we got definitely an improved assembly in terms of the, the short read one, but it was still... Um, a bit fragmented and we weren't really confident that that technology is that great for handling a lot of different types of repeats. And so um, for his PhD thesis, Shane started to develop a pipeline for doing uh, long read sequencing assembly. So this is the um, pipeline that he used. So it's sort of base input 33x coverage of Oxford nanopore data. So we did this 
sequencing in-house using Minion. And um, Shane used various assemblers and various other downstream programs in this pipeline. And at each step, the, um, the equality assembly was assessed using mapping back short reads, looking at Busco, and then these other tools, Mercury and Quas and so on. And so um, various long read assemblers were used and, and he experimented with merging, contigs, that kind of thing. Usual sort of process of purging duplicates and then polishing the assembly using reasonably high coverage Illumina data. And then we had a high C library as well. And so high C anchoring, gap closing, um, modeling of repeats and repeat masking and, the, and then annotation. So a fairly sort of standard um, approach, but with a lot of assessment of a sequence quality, assembly quality each step in this. And so we're pretty happy with the assembly we got out of this, despite the fact that the Nanopore data wasn't super high coverage. So um, we were using all high C, because we know the, the carrier type of this organism, we're able to use high um, all high C and assemble the scaffolds into 18 super scaffolds, which, and the super scaffolds incorporate the vast majority of, of the scaffolds uh, in the data set. And we're pretty happy with these N50 and um, the length of the longest scaffolds. Pretty happy with the Busco, complete single copy Busco genes, 95.8%. So we're getting pretty good coverage of the gene space and um, happy with the, the, uh, the paired mapping rate back to the genome assembly. So yeah, we were pretty confident we had a reasonably good high quality assembly that we were able to use um, to study some downstream evolutionary biology. So the, the next step was to um, reconstruct the history of reticulation among these genera. And so the strategy we took here was to look at the mitochondrial DNA diversity and other data we had previously and identify populations that we were going to target for um, resequencing. So we're targeting the three species with an acanthoxyla, uh, Clytarchus, um, and a couple other lineage as well. And so our strategy here was um, we wanted to phase all the, um, we wanted to phase large elements of the genome to make gene trees. And so to do that, you need reasonably high quality, high coverage Illumina data. So you got really you got really accurate SNP calls because that's really important for phasing. Um, we did about 15x coverage of ON sequencing on the triploids because you really need long read data to phase those. The diploids, we use short read data to phase them. And the reason we're able to get away with this is because the hybrid genomes are really highly heterozygous. And so there are a lot of SNPs that fall within um, you know, there are maybe two or three SNPs on average that fall within an average short read. And so there's enough signal in there with short read data to get some pretty good phasing. And then, yeah, call SNPs, phase alleles, and then reconstruct the evolutionary history. So I'll just talk, uh, so the other thing is, yeah, as I said, there are triploids and diploids within this data as well. And we had a pretty good idea of the polity level based on um, previous studies. So we confirmed that by looking at the short read data and using this tool Inquire, which is basically you call SNPs on your data and then looks at base frequencies at those SNPs and then fits models for different plotty levels. And so you can see here that the um, the models that fit the best are the, are the shortest bars here. And so we're able to um, confirm that the three triploids were in fact triploids and that's supported by the SNP data. And then a couple of diploids here um, are indeed diploid as well. So we're pretty confident we've got the polity right, which is important for the for the phasing, of course. So this is a strategy that um, Jane used to phase the triploids and diploids and then generate alignments for building gene trees. And so um, MAP reads the reference, SNP calling with GATK, and then using the polyphase tool from WhatsApp to phase the triploids. And so we used Illumina data and Oxford nanopore sequences to do that. Um, and then find overlaps between the triploid phase blocks and build alignments from those, and then find corresponding overlap between the diploid phase blocks as well, and then trim those regions, align them with muscle, and then use uh, RaxML to make gene trees. And so we focused on the Busco genes here, and the reason why we did that is because some of the downstream network methods we used are really computationally intensive, and so they kind of choke up if you throw too much data at them. And the other reason is, is that um, 
the bus go genes, we're pretty confident that they are indeed single copy. And so we don't want to be including multi-copy regions in the phasing because that's going to um, disrupt things a lot. And so that allowed us to get about a thousand phase blocks to make gene trees from. And um, phase blocks about 500 base pairs to 2KB or a bit more. That might seem a bit short, but it's actually it's actually enough to get pretty good gene trees and to make downstream inferences. And then another, I guess, obvious observation from this is that the samples that had a high heterozygosity were easier to phase and we got much longer phase blocks from them. So this is an example of a couple of the gene trees that we get from um, these alignments of phase allele. So once again, you can see the classic pattern of um, two clades. One clade only contains allele sub of macanthoxyla, so here and here in this gene tree. And then another clade here where you see a mixture of acanthoxyla and Clytarchus alleles as well. So again, you're seeing this, this signal of hybridization. And in some of these gene trees, you can see evidence of multiple hybridization events. So you can see the Clytarchus alleles are interspersed with some of the acanthoxyl alleles. That's a classic signal you expect from independent hybridization events. And also confirming our earlier work is that for some individuals, you get this deeper history of hybridization. So, so for one individual, you, which is a triploid, you have three alleles all within the single clade here. So it's evidence that there's a there's an older history of hybridization within acanthoxyla that only involves acanthoxyla and not other genera. And so um, the next step is to take these gene trees and then to start to infer networks from them. And so we use this. Um, program follow net and so you input your gene trees into that and this is um this is basically a parsimony type algorithm but you can use a likelihood orthogram as well but that's a lot slower so we're still chipping away at that and the nice thing about this is that it allows you to um identify the the number of independent hybridization events in the data so here it's able to infer that from a lineage related to Clytarchus sukari now you get three independent hybridization events so three effective gene flow events involving Clytarchus and acanthoxyla. Um, the other thing we did is we called SNPs on the low coverage genomes um, and the reference genome. And we used some of these SNP based methods to look at gene flow as well. And so these are some of these divergences are quite old. So you get a huge number of SNPs in the data set. So we're able to call using GATK, you know, 238 million SNPs in the data set. And then um, use this program D suite, which is based on these ABBA or D statistics, which you can infer gene flow between different lineages or populations. This is a bit more difficult to interpret because you have to, into this particular um, application of D suite, you have to input a, um, I guess, a kind of a reference tree. And because these species aren't evolving under a pure bifurcating pattern of just speciation and divergence, it's a little bit. Um, subjective what species tree topology you put into the method. And if you change the species tree topology you input into it, you get different inferences of gene flow among species. But it basically confirmed um, the same pattern as we got from the network analysis that you get in the, that there is signal for independent hybridization events between these two genera. The other thing is um, you'll notice that the sexual species here, acanthoxyla um, novel species one, there's no signal in the in the gene tree network for it being involved in any hybridization. But if you look at the D suite um, figure here, so this is like a heat map. This shows the signal for effectively for this, the sharing of alleles between um, lineages. You can see there is signal for gene flow from the sexual, well, between the sexual species and some of the pathogens. But this signal, again, it's dependent on the on the guide tree that you input into the method. So it just makes these SNP based methods a little harder to interpret. Um, yeah, so to summarize the evolutionary side of things, we're pretty happy with the, the bioinformatics in terms of, of the phasing method. We think, we've, um, we think the amount of data and, and the software seems to be doing a pretty good job of that. The downstream population genetic tools um, some of them aren't ideal. So what I didn't mention is some of these methods you have to, they can't handle polyploid genotypes. So you have to recode your 
um, SNPs into biallelic SNPs or, or only use biallelic SNPs from the data sets. That's a bit of a limitation. And some of these methods also, um, they have coalescent assumptions. So if you have if you have pathogens within your data set, you're obviously violating assumptions there. So the I guess the bioinformatic methods, I think we're kind of happy with, but the downstream evolutionary or population genetic methods um, aren't ideal. Um, different inferences with with some respects with regard to gene trees versus SNPs. And the other point I'll make is that it's what we've done is pretty expensive in terms of data. So we've sequenced these polyploids at pretty high levels in terms of Illumina data and um, ONT data as well. But the, the plus side is, is I think you get pretty robust estimates of what's going on with evolution. So, and we can infer independent hybridization events in the data. We, we also have some uh, GBS data that I haven't shown, which suggests that with the SNP methods, we can actually start to identify um, which regions of New Zealand or which populations are where they found in New Zealand have been involved in hybridization. So when we sample different populations of Clytarchus hookeri, and this just shows mitochondrial DNA um, diversity here, we can actually start to identify which geographic region has been involved in these different hybridization events. So we've done that with GBS data, but I think with more sequencing, with more low coverage sequencing of these populations, we can we can pinpoint that a little better. So that's kind of a, um, an interesting um, angle as well we might explore in the future. So the other thing I just um, want to talk a bit about is how we've used this framework or our reconstructions to look at gene expression um, in these pathogens. And the, I guess the phenomenon we looked at is this homolog expression bias. And so a lot of people be familiar with the fact that we you know when you have hybridization, you get this genomic shock going on within the genome. And um, one example is this homolog expression bias or HEB. And so this is just the unequal contribution of homologs to total gene expression. So if you have two or more alleles coming together in a hybrid, there might be some, um, uh, adjustments of the regulation of gene expression. So one allele or homolog gets expressed over another one. And this is quite a well-known phenomenon in plants. It's quite, it's studied a lot, lots of different plants because hybridization is such a common phenomenon in plants, but it's not really that well studied in animals. There are some examples from Xenopus, the frog, from um, some fish genera, from salamanders uh, and Daphne as well. But we weren't able to find any examples of this in insects. So we were just wanted to see, you know, how this process operates in insects and in, um, in hybridization and pathogenesis. So related to this concept is this, is this mitonuclear incompatibility. And so if you look at this diagram on the right here, if, if you think about a, um, you know, a protein, a, a, a protein pathway, for which there are the proteins are encoded the nucleus and the mitochondrion you often get this tight co-evolution that's um means that the proteins are co-adapted to operate together in the pathway and so different species will have different protein sequences that are that are fine-tuned to work well with each other and when you bring those together in hybridization you get this kind of allelic mismatch and people have looked a lot of this at in terms of sequence the protein sequence and the gene expression um, and a good example of the pathways that people looked at is, is oxidative phosphorylation, where you get most of the proteins are encoded in the nucleus, but some are, are encoded in the mitochondrion. And so you can um, hypothesize that where you have um, hybridization occurring, and in the hybrid, the hybrid has retained the mitochondrial DNA of one of the ancestors, you might predict that there'll be HEB towards the homologs that are derived from the same parent um, as the mitochondrial genome. If there is selection to maintain the co-adaptation between the proteins that are encoded in the mitochondrion and the nucleus. So this is one phenomenon that we wanted to look at. And if you look at the mitochondrial, so this, this is a gene tree of whole mitochondrial genomes, and you can see that within acanthoxyla, they always only express acanthoxyla mitochondrial DNA. So despite the hybridization, the hybrid lineages have not retained Clytarchus um, mitochondrial genome. So you might expect that there is HEB in the direction of the H of the acanthoxyl homologs. Um, and another uh, another um, 
thing we looked at was also ribosomal proteins as well. And so this is a, a diagram of a ribosome. So it's ribosomal proteins actor, interacting with ribosomal RNA. And people have looked at this in hybridization uh, in terms of the sequence of ribosomal proteins and found that there's coevolution between the ribosome um, RNA sequences and the proteins. And so we sort of wonder whether we'd see similar patterns in terms of gene expression. And so um, you might expect that in a hybrid genome that there'll be HEB towards the homeologs that were derived from the same ancestor as the nuclear ribosomal RNA, because ribosomal RNA tends to be in the same copy um, in a genome, but not always, of course. And so this is a, a gene tree of 28S ribosomal RNA sequences. So again, this sort of familiar pattern. There's a clade here of only acanthoxyla alleles, and then there's a clade down here where there are acanthox some acanthoxyla are sharing alleles with Clytarchus. And so we might predict here that you get HEB in um, ribosomal proteins towards Clytarchus, whereas these ones might show it towards acanthoxyla. It's a bit more complicated here because there is one acanthoxyla hybrid which is actually heterozygous for its ribosomal RNA, so it's not quite clear what you'd expect there. And so this is the approach we took. Um, for these lineages, we sampled five individuals and we did reasonably deep RNA sequencing, so 20 million lumina paired in reads per individual. And so this is one of those sort of, you know, areas of science where you have a question and you think, oh, well, this is going to be pretty straightforward. We've got this reference genome. We'll do RNA-seq and we'll map reads to the genome and then we'll look for HEB towards um, one or other homeolog. But it actually turned out, not surprisingly, to be vastly more complicated than this. And um, Shane put a lot of work into the bioinformatics. And we think we've got the bioinformatics um, kind of sorted here, but we're still kind of scratching the surface of, of the biology and what it means to a certain extent. So um, the problem here is one of reference bias. And so this is a pretty familiar concept in bioinformatics. If you know one type of allele doesn't map so well to a reference genome, it will appear to be underexpressed relative to the allele it maps um, well. And so there are some tools to deal with this bioinformatically. And a really popular one is this program called WASP. And how WASP works is that um, you map reads your genome and, and you call SNPs. And then once you've got the SNPs called, you take that into WASP and then WASP remaps the reads. And when a read overlaps one of these SNPs, it flips the SNP over, remaps the read and basically says, you know, does the read map in the same place? If it doesn't, then the read gets discarded because it's assuming that that read is sensitive to the SNP. And so potentially it's going to introduce a bias into the, into the measures of gene expression. And so you put your data through this and it, and it, and it filters, filters the reads out. And then you can use the, the reads remaining to do your downstream gene um, expression analysis. And so we did that. And initially when we did that, we found the signal um, of HEB was in the direction of the reference genome. And so we got a little suspicious and we tried the ref a reference genome from um, the other parental species. And we found, and I'll show some results from this in a second, and it showed that the direction of HEB was towards the second reference genome, even though we had taken the data through WASP, which was meant to um, deal with this bias. And so we ended up using three reference genomes to measure HEB. We used genomes that represent the two um, ancestors, and we used an outgroup um, as well, which is equid phylogenically equidistant from, uh, from the parents. And so yeah, this involves uh, mapping with STAR and, and then SNP calling uh, with GATK. And because we got this resequencing data, we're able to classify SNPs as coming from one or other uh, parental genome. And then because the inferences of HEB are, de are um, dependent on the reference genome, and we've got three reference genomes we're using, we considered a gene to be showing HEB if it was significant for two out of the three reference genomes. Doesn't matter which of the two out of the three it was, just any, um, any of them. And so we figure that's a reasonably conservative approach to identifying um, homolog expression bias in the data. So this is the kind of um, result you get. So this is after WASP filtering of the data. And so on, this is a, this is a, um, these are all, this is a, the same pathogen, the, the same data set. 
uh, mapped to three different reference genomes. And so on the left, it's mapping to the Clytarchus reference genome. And so the x-axis shows the, um, the sequencing depth of the Clytarchus diagnostic alleles. And so, you know, it goes from zero to one. And so it's skewed to the right. And so that's suggestive of HEB towards um, Clytarchus. But so this graph on um, the right-hand side is mapping to the acanthoxyl reference genome. And you can see that the Clytarchus or Karai SNPs um, are sort of undercovered. And so the skew is to the left. So it's suggesting there's a trend towards reference by uh, HEB towards the acanthoxyl. And then you can see in the middle here using the out group, it's, um, it's a bit more balanced. So it just shows you how important the reference genome is for these inferences. Um, you might say, why didn't you just use the out group reference genome to make your inferences? Well, the thing is, is that the Clytarchus reference is our high quality super scaffolds. Um, the acanthox reference genome is a chromium, is a chromium assembly, so it's not quite as good a quality and, and the buscos aren't quite as good. So we're missing a bunch of genes. And then the outgroup reference is actually a short, is short read data that's reference assembled. So we're missing even more genes. And so um, it's, it's not, we, you can't make as robust inferences about what genes are differentially expressed because you're missing a, a bunch of genes in the assembly. And so what do we get out of this? So this is um, going back to oxidative phosphorylation. And so we found that um, the, this GO category was enriched for genes that were HEB towards both parental genomes. And so you can see from the heat map that some genes here are showing HEB towards Clytarchus, these are the blue ones, and some genes are showing HEB towards acanthoxylus. So there's no sort of universal pattern across genes in the pathway. In terms of clustering the patterns of HEB, you can see that it doesn't sort of match the what you might expect from the phylogeny. So the two individuals here from acanthoxyl and nermis we included, they're not, their patterns of HEB aren't more similar to each other than they are to um, the other pathogens. Um, a similar pattern with uh, ribosomes, at this GO category was enriched for genes that were HEB to both towards, um, well towards Clytarchus in three populations and not significant in uh, the fourth population. And um, this one did actually cluster according to the phylogeny. So the two acanthoxyl and nermis individuals are more similar to each other in terms of their HEB pattern than they are to these other two um, populations here. So to summarize, um, yeah, reference bias turned out to be quite a significant problem for the analyses. And in our case, the only way that we could really deal with it was by using multiple reference genomes. And so um, it's quite common in molecular ecology for people to look at asymmetric allele expression in hybrid zones and, and hybrid species. And typically they'll sequence, you know, one reference genome and then map reads and make inferences. And it'll be interesting to look for someone to go through and look at those studies and see whether there's a, a bit of a bias towards finding HEB or allelic specific expression towards the reference genome. In our case, um, it was, yeah, a pretty significant problem. Um, we didn't sort of find strong evidence that mitonuclear incompatibility was really driving the direction of HEB, but we probably need to uh, dig into that a little bit further, I think. Um, and a similar kind of, um, similar pattern in terms of uh, protein, um, ribosomal proteins as well. Um, so in these, in the examples I showed you and other ones, the, the, the populations aren't always grouping in terms of the phylogeny, but it's not a controlled experiment. We haven't factored in environmental effects or maternal effects or things like that. And again, we don't really know what's controlling um, these shifts in, in um, gene regulation, and that is going to be the topic of some future research. So um, I just now want to um, skip on to giving you an update on another couple of insect groups that we've been doing some genomics on, on uh, the hoo hoo beetle and, and giant wetter. So the hoo hoo beetle, um, this is a partnership with the Taha Hohonu Forest Trust up in um, East Cape area. And Natalie Forsdick and uh, Manpreet Dami at Landcare Research, they're, they're leading the analysis, the genome assembly and the, um, the metagenomics stuff we're doing as well. And then uh, Elena Hilario from Plant Food Research and, and a whole lot of people from Landcare also helping out with various aspects of this. And we're interested in this thing um, for a couple of reasons. 
So, you know, there's well-known Mataranga and so on that where what wood host the lava is in affects the flavour of, of the lava. And we're also interested in this in terms of its um, wood digestion capabilities. And so that's why we're doing um, some microbiome uh, work as well as, as the genome. So this, again, is nanopore data. So this, this genome assembly is work in progress. Um, the genome, it's about, well, based on flow cytometry, it's about 1.3 to 1.8 gigabases. So it's a reasonable size thing. We've got, I guess, moderate level um, coverage of the nanopore data. The assembly is still pretty highly fragmented. And so um, we're still doing a bit of work on it, looking at different long read assemblers. And there's a high C library in, in preparation as well. So um, we should be making more progress on that soon. But I just wanted to quickly show you some of the metagenomics data we're getting out of this. We've been um, looking at the bacterial 16S communities um, across different parts of the digestive tract and comparing those communities and not, not finding a difference there. But we are finding a significant difference in terms of gut bacteria when we compare different, different tree wood hosts. So um, comparing pine and red beech, they've got different uh, bacterial communities there. And so we're going to start to look a bit more at the biology of that and also start to look at some at some of the fungal the fungal communities as well. Um, and the last thing I just want to um, update people on is our work on the Wetapunga uh, genome. And so um, this is a pretty well known insect. It's some argue it's the largest or well, the heaviest insect in the world. It's, it used to be widespread throughout Northland and Auckland region. So this specimen here um, was collected from the Bay of Islands in 1838. So, you know, it was on the mainland then. This is actually the oldest specimen in any, in any insect collection, the oldest New Zealand insect in any collection in the world. This is from the Auckland Museum. And this was collected by um, Colenso in the Bay of Islands in 1838. So it was wiped out by rats on the mainland probably. Um, and it was relictual. It was only found for quite a quite a while on Hoturu, uh, Little Barrier Island off the coast of Auckland. Um, and I need to acknowledge uh, Nati Manahuri, who are um, mana whenua uh, for that island for supporting our, our research and sampling. And so it was restricted to um, Hoturu, but there have been there are various captive breeding efforts underway, and people are reintroducing it to uh, sanctuaries and other offshore islands. But that's done in the absence of robust population genetic data, so we don't really know much about the impact of genetic diversity that those translocations are having, and you know how diverse those um, translocated populations are. So the goal here is to get some genomic resources together to support that. So. Yeah, giant wetters, giant genomes. So this is the flow cytometry result using using locust as a size standard. So it's giving us a size of 8.4 gigabases. The KEMA methods on short read data are estimating at 6.3. And so our previous research on, on wetters has shown it's actually quite hard to nail down the exact genome size. Um, suffice to say that it's pretty huge and, and pretty difficult to sequence and assemble. And so for this, we use PAC bio data um to to assemble it and so we did an initial assembly um a couple of years ago using pack bio data uh, with pretty high coverage alumina data to error correct and, and polishing and we did a high c library as well but we didn't end up sequencing the high c library very deeply because it actually wasn't that great we're actually in the process of making a new high c library now and so if you look at the of uh, the, the first version that assembly um it's not that great. There's lots of huge numbers of contigs. The size is a lot smaller than, you know, what we anticipated. You know, the bus goes, you know, not, not very good either. And so we went back, back and we collected a, ho a whole lot of HiFi data. And this actually is interesting because it shows the power of HiFi, you know, compared to the, the older um, PAC bio technology. And so the coverage here is, is the HiFi is only marginally higher coverage than the, the SQL data. But you can see that the genome size, the assembly size is, you know, a lot closer to what we expect. Big reduction in the number of contigs, you know, big uh, increase in contig length, you know, N50. And then this is just with minimal high C um, scaffolding. The, it's, you know, the bus goes actually starting to look pretty good. So we're pretty optimistic we're going to get um, a pretty good quality assembly for the giant wetter once we get the high C data sorted. Um, 
Yeah, so that's that's what I was going to talk about. I, I really want to acknowledge, and with regard to the stick insect sampling, I want to acknowledge the Maori communities who have supported this literally from the bottom of New Zealand right um, to the top of New Zealand. So we've really appreciated that. Um, I want to acknowledge Nessie as well. You can imagine the workload that has been placed on Nessie with some of these analyses, and it's it, that's been a really amazing resource. And um, yeah, a big call out also to Dinny, who's really helped with a lot of stuff. Um, and then funding from GA and the Marsden Fund as well. And I just want to flag also that we're just kicking off a new project now, which we're going to take and we're going to start to explore in a bit more detail some of the um, stick and set genomic results we've got. And this is going to be led by uh, Gemma Collins, who's a, a new postdoc here at Landcare Research. Tithi Gandhi, who's going to be starting her PhD um, next week, in fact. And Julie Blumart from um, Plant and Food Research, who knows a lot about the genomes of weird invertebrates. And then Octavio Palacios Jimenez, who's um, in Jena in Germany, and he's a he's an expert in the genomics of orthopterans and sex chromosomes and that kind of stuff. So um, watch this space. And um, yeah, thank you for um, listening. All right, folks, thank you very much for tuning in. I'd just like to thank Thomas again for an excellent seminar. I'll do the, the thunderous applause.